are, and they are go not going to replace. Uh, the next generation of engineers, first, if they find engineers who agree to work in a plant, uh, those guys will not accept to spend 25 years to learn the plant. So uh, this implicit know-how, which is the base of most of those factories, is going away and not being replaced. So this is added to the complexity. For that reason, here is what, what, what we hear of manufacturing executives. Their, their, their main opportunities are along two axes. First, horizontally, there's the product axis along the design, build, and service. In design, they need to reduce time to market have ever and, and go and conceive ever more specific products. That's one. And then uh, those products more and more are enhanced by services, so more and more connected products which allow to deliver services. Those services are to be designed with the product. So there's a whole series of, of issues for our customers and opportunities for us along the product life cycle dimension, which we are not going to talk about today. This is the area of product PLM, product life cycle management, very important offer for digital manufacturing, but an offer we know uh, we have the right partners with Dassault and Siemens and PTC. We know how to do it, no big revolution. So uh, we're not going to talk about it today because this is not where the big revolution is happening. Very, very important, big projects, we know how to do it. The big revolution of IoT is happening in the other dimension, which is the, the build dimension, all the way from planning, uh, and as we said, plan to get maximum returns and then operating the, these this assets. And the, the big problem is constant optimization. Uh, relentlessly better understand your operations get, and get more out of those while keeping safe and compliant operations. So that's what, and this is not new, but uh, the, 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 the issues are not new. What's new is the opportunity with industrial IoT, and we're going to talk about it. Then the, the, the manufacturing execs uh, have two other comments usually. Uh, they've invested a lot in the IT system, so they rolled out an ERP core system. You know, most of the companies now have, have figured out the ERP. They've uh, uh, invested into automation and in the, between the ERP and automation, implemented an MES system, manufacturing execution system. But nevertheless, they, they, they don't feel they get, you know, the kind of visibility they need. It's mostly a rear view visibility, not really, and they have the feeling that they didn't get the, the money back in all those investments. Uh, second, and that's for the IT, second, uh, on, on, on the, the, the culture side, most of the companies today have embarked on what is called lean manufacturing, which is um, a, a Japanese, a, the, the coalescence of many Japanese ways of uh, improving operations like just-in-time, TQM, uh, total preventative maintenance. And those uh, have converged into what is called lean manufacturing. Most of our customers have now leaned their operations, are in the process of leaning their operations, which is a continuous improvement logic. We're going to come back on, on that in a minute. But here again, uh, the, the this low tech simplicity of lean, which is great because it drives the right culture change, this continuous improvement culture, which is indispensable, is hitting the wall of complexity number one, and number two, the, 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 that that culture has the risk of going out with people when they retire. So, but mostly the the, the issue they have is the the complexity, the scope and complexity of the operations. They say lean is okay, but we're reaching the end. And, and if I had to put a little curve, you know, this looks complex, but what it says is in, if this is the uh, uh, time, the horizontal axis in time and, and the vertical axis is performance. So the lean program, lean programs are reaching uh, a plateau. You know, they stop progressing and the red line says that's the risk of actually going back because the guys who are running those lean programs, the experienced people are actually retiring. So the risk that lean, lean is great, great culture change, but it's, it's running out of steam. And what happens is, I, and we're going to see how, IoT te digital manufacturing is about uh, using IoT technologies to start uh, another S-curve, to restart the lean because you can tackle the complexity. And then also you lock in the improvements because the, 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 the improvements are not in the head of people walking out of the factory, uh, out, out of the factory into retirement. You actually uh, lock, you actually implement those improvements into technology. 
So digital manufacturing is about using technology to reaccelerate the performance improvement curve and then lock it in. And then afterwards, uh, every time you reinvest into new technology or new levels of automation, uh, the, the same digital manufacturing is going to allow you, because you have better control on your operations, because you know what you're doing, is going to reduce the time to value of further automation and technology. So this, it will allow you to resume investing into technology, uh, getting the results out of it. So that's, that's what really what clients are looking for. Restart the dynamic of performance improvement and then accelerate the time to value every time they invest into new technology. And that's what uh, we can help them do. And why, why is it today that they're reaching the end of lean? It's because um, um, the inflexibility of OT systems. All those systems we have on the shop floor are usually fairly old, not architected for openness and flexibility, and they are poorly integrated with the IT system. So as a result, when people want to improve operations, first they need to understand what's going on. And here, they only get a partial view, only maybe 30, 40% of the data they need to collect from the shop floor, from machines, from the environment, is actually channeled through systems. The rest is on post-it notes, notes on Excel spreadsheets, and whatever comes up with systems is usually across three different systems. So that's, that's an issue. Second, uh, what you collect from the shop floor only has so much meaning until you can put it in contact with other data. For instance, the fact that your machine, you know, the pressure on your uh, press is higher than usual is not necessarily a problem if you know that it's because the raw material is coming from this supplier and, and we know that this raw material is slightly different so this pressure is higher. On the other hand, if the, if the material was coming from the other supplier, this pressure would be a problem and would cause issues. Again, if you don't have in the system that data coming from the ERP with the right signals coming from your shop floor, you don't know you're going to make the, right, the wrong decision. So people, because they don't have all the data not in context, they make ad hoc decisions. You know, they, they, they guess things. They work by intuition. And then whenever they make a decision, it's loosely implemented. You know, they go and move a knob and, or call someone to change something, and this is not recording in the system. As a result, the system cannot track whether the action was the right one, and next time around, maybe somebody will take a wrong decision. So basically, the, the, the whole objective of IoT technologies allow you to go from that broken loop to a real closed loop where you have end-to-end -end system support in collecting the right data, putting in context, making the decisions, and implementing those decisions. And as you know, the big change is IoT technologies because IoT technologies allows you without touching your existing um, IT, which you don't want to touch because it's running the plant, it's uh, producing for you, allows you to deploy new sensors, and we're going to talk about that and see how in a second. Um, you can put, you know, very simple networks, wireless networks into the plant that don't cost you a lot, that allow you to then connect those sensors without touching the existing networks. You store all this and then you use machine learning to make sense out of it, and again, we're going to see how, how that works. So this is the IoT technology. And the IoT technologies allow people to start improving operations, and usually they start, most, in most industries, they're going to start with asset reliability. So using those technologies to connect your press, uh, putting new sensors. So, so for instance, uh, many, many uh, in, um, metal stamping presses, noise is really important. And people know, know how to analyze the noise by the press, and they know, the experience operators know, that they recognize when the press is going to break by the noise. We deploy microphones on, on presses, and then we take that data and put it through machine learning, and then the, machine, the, the computer will say when the thing will break. So all those new sensors allow you to, put, to get the adequate data out of your equipment and prevent those from breaking. And every time you prevent uh, an equipment from breaking, this is money going to your bottom line. You, you avoid losing production. You avoid spending money. So usually people start there. Then the next level, which requires a bit more sophisticated analytics and new sensors, is not just I'm going to prevent the equipment from breaking down, is I'm going to make sure that when it works, I get maximum performance out of that asset. And that, again, money to the bottom line. Then I'm not going to look at the assets, one asset or two assets. I'm going to use at the entire line. 
which is another level of the way it starts really getting complex and interesting, and we're going to talk about that. And then I look at quality and then look at performance. So th that's why clients love the kind of offer we're going to talk about because with fairly small investments, they can get um, bottom line results out of existing assets. They get more out of what they have and they better understand the way they produce so they, they get back to this uh, um, green loop of continuous progress. The loop runs faster, more reliably, goes deeper, wider, so all benefits. Now, the problem is so far, uh, clients who wanted to do that had to go, you know, they, they would hire our IND colleagues, insights and data colleagues to build that stuff on those such solutions on top of, of raw technology which is okay, we needed to do it, but it was, it was costly um, and, and you, you had a one-off solution. So the, the great to solve one problem, but then for the client, not so great because every time they have a new problem, they have to call us again. So the good news is that someone, some companies start productizing the green loop. And one of those companies happens to be a partner of Capgemini, it's a small company called BrainCube. The other such companies, one of them is called uh, Sync IQ in the US, but there's not that many. And BrainCube is uh, very visibly the best. Uh, whenever they, they are benchmarked against other solutions, they, they usually win. And w they have like uh, 40, 50 references already where they can show the kind of results you see on the slide. And uh, we have been working with them for the last 18 months. And we've decided to uh, uh, kind of OEM their solution. So um, we're going to be positioning, delivering uh, the products around the solution, and BrainCube will be uh, as seen by the client almost as a Capgemini solution. So we're going to put the credibility and, and stability of Capgemini to accelerate the growth around this offer. What BrainCube does is it, the complete cycle. It allows you to connect, collect the right data, understand that data. Um, analyze it, the phase three, and, and phase three is really interesting because the solution is structured so that it is a common uh, work environment for a process engineer, so the experienced process engineers who know the factory, and our data analyst to little by little structure the intuition of the process analyst into algorithm and into rules, and then the solution not only uh, is, is tackling uh, this part, which is, is tackling asset performance, line efficiency, and quality. So it's tackling the really interesting part of uh, analytics. And, and what it does is uh, once you understand what good looks like, then the system will constantly monitor and make sure that the production line remains in condition to produce good products. To give you an example, we've, developed, we've deployed this solution at Dior on a lipstick, uh, on a lipstick product line. This line has 200 parameters and each parameter is, is measured uh, second by second and the, the, the software has allowed us to understand which parameters are really influencing the quality of the lipstick and then put this into the right uh, param equations and the right rules so that the system constantly keeps the line in, in, the, right, uh, in the right operating condition. So, you're going to hear uh, about this uh, solution. We've started uh, training uh, Capgemini people to be able to deliver it, uh, both sell it and deliver it. We've had, uh, we already started posi positioning it in into accounts. Last week I was with Procter & Gamble, the, the head of IT for manufacturing at Procter & Gamble, very interested. She wants to know more. So that's a uh, very good, uh, it, it, it seems to confirm that this is a very good entry point into accounts. Now. This is not all, and usually, but this will give us a very good first result, i.e. Uh, allow to prove to customers that they, by better leveraging data, they can get results out of uh, tangible results and bottom line results and fairly fast. Usually after two, three months, you start showing results, and that's great, but it's not enough. Uh, most clients who, you know, who are already, who have done the first uh, pilots with BrainCube or similar solutions, when they want to scale, then they have to confront the, the root causes for the broken loop. Why is the loop broken today? Because the, the, the whole stack has been implemented at hazard. ERP was implemented on its own logic, uh, then the automation 
um, is usually not integrated. There's lots of diversity. It's mostly islands of automation, poorly integrated. When they try to put an MES in the middle to solve the integration, uh, usually those things are not done for that. MES is mostly a, a, a mailbox between the ERP and the shop floor, but it, it is usually not open architectures, not always. Uh, the MES, the most modern MES are really progressing fast, but most companies have outdated MESs out there, and it's spaghetti integration. A company like Volvo has a thousand major interfaces at that level. And then finally, the whole thing is not well integrated into the product or, or, or factory design. So whenever you want to take product uh, um, information into operations to be able to optimize or check what you're doing, it's very painful. So basically, and that's the price for us, once we get into, into the door with, and, and prove results with a solution like BrainQ, very quickly, the guy, the CIO, would come back and say, wait a minute, I understand, it's great. Now, if I want to scale, I need to solve this thing. And then that's why we see um, more and more interest into operations and MES in particular. So the MES market is really waking up. More and more uh, calls from customers of saying, come and help me on my MES, I understand. Lots of innovation in EMES. We see new players coming with cloud-based, uh, open standard uh, IT MESs. So there's something brewing in the MES because people realize that they have to solve the integration issue if they want to if they want to scale in digital manufacturing. The modern MES will remain the backbone of uh, digital manufacturing. And what they're looking for, so there's a new category that starts appearing. And, and we, start, we try to brand it as smart mom, where mom means manufacturing operations management, which is another way of saying manufacturing execution system, but a bit broader. And the difference between an, a classical uh, MES and, and a smart mom would be that a, a mostly about the scope. Usually the mom will cover more than manufacturing. It will cover the full operations, including uh, logistics. But most importantly, it's architected very differently. It's, it's database, it's event driven, it's open, and, and the, the key requirement is flexibility. Uh, people cannot deal with the inflexibility of the systems and they want to be able to constantly change that thing. Scalability is also very important and obviously it needs to be modular, scalable, and all those good things. So that's where, uh, that's where we are with, the, uh, uh, with that market. And the idea and what I call the prize is we are trying and we're working with the high tech and PNES and apps and IND to try position Capgemini as the company who can take a client from today, uh, you know, with an outdated MES to this notion uh, of, of smart mode. Now, the real art is how you do that. And needless to say that this is operation. So, Going to a customer and say, you know, we're going to rip and replace your MES, or we're going to rip and replace your existing architecture, is just a no, is a non-starter. First, it's producing. Second, there's no money uh, like in the the good old days of ERP, where people would pay us, you know, five, ten, twenty millions uh, for three years to implement a, to develop a core system and and then deploy it. That is not going to work. So what most uh, clients do, and, and, and we do it with them, is first, they don't touch, that's in the middle, they don't touch the existing stack, and they add a, a solution like BrainCube on side by side. As I, we said earlier, you know, it's not, you leave what you have, and a, a solution like the BrainCube, or what is generally called a data hub, which is, uh, will allow you to, number one, implement new sensors on the shop floor. So if you want to put a microphone on your price, for instance, you don't go through the control system, you hook it directly to the cloud and you run analytics on the sound. If you want to implement a, a video camera to change uh, the, the color or the shape of things coming out, same thing, you can go direct. Or it can be more simply, simply a temperature sensor, humidity sensor, or whatever sensor. And there's a robust market of people deploying uh, cheap sensors to give you more information than goes to the control system about the operation. So you take this new data, the data you can extract from the control system, the data you can extract from the MES and historian, you bring it into this uh, a kind of, the kind of solution BrainCube has. And here, 
uh, in a safe environment because, again, you're not disturbing your operations. You can learn, you can understand, and you can get those percentage of efficiency. And initially, you, you implement it by hand. And then the art, and that's what we, we start doing with clients and, and what they're going to pay a lot of money for, is then if you help them go from the center to the right-hand side, over, over time, you know, not in one shot, but progressively bring this thing from the side and merge it with the MES and the historian into this notion of mom. Now, it, it sounds uh, complicated, and it, it did, it is, which is why clients will, will need us. They will need a company that Capgemini, who masters control systems, who knows MES, who knows ERP, who knows complex architectures, who has IND people. But we know it is possible, and we have one example. In, it's a uh, manufacturing company where we are doing it. We, uh, over the last uh, 18 months, we've, we've done phase one. And in 2018, uh, on the back end of 2018, the plan is to take their MES, which is completely outdated, dismantle it, and rebuild it um, in a modular fashion on top of the data hub. The data hub uh, is different from, in this particular case, it is GE Critics. Uh, but it's, it, could, it could have been uh, BrainCube and um, another technology. So we know um, the, the good, we're cheating because the, this first customer we do it with is fairly simple. Their, their MES is very simple, but we, we believe and many clients believe that this is possible. And again, this is what we would like to be known for. The company who can help you not rip and replace, but encapsulate and extend your existing IT, um, IT OT architecture and get the most out of it. And if we get that, this is a three to five years, very mutually profitable client, um, a relationship with the client that combines you know, CC know-how for uh, what we've seen earlier, the deployment of, of all the analytics, um, very uh, good uh, infrastructure work, uh, apps work, the, the, the complete. And again, uh, Capgemini is ideally positioned to deliver those kind of services, and that's what we're going to try to do. Now, all this is nice, but Again, it's complicated, so a long and convoluted sales cycle. So with that, uh, that's uh, what I had to share with you. I hope uh, it was clear enough, and uh, we're open for questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Pascal. So participants, so please feel free to ask any queries to the chat and the Q&A section. All right, I see we had 40 people online, so I'm sure someone has a question or a remark. Did you like it? Was it clear? I'm the lead for IoT in the Netherlands. It's great to see your presentation and view on the your manufacturing. Slide 7 states time to value shorter. We notice that the investment is often quite high. Because they, uh, are there clear ideas on how to get to shorten time to value with investment? Uh, yes, and again, the idea is through it, it's even it's even different as I as I said we believe that in most cases clients can get value without big investments before they go invest into new machines before they go into invest into robots let me give you an example uh, at uh, G oil and gas uh, those guys manufacture turbine complex machinery for oil and gas companies by applying um, manufacturing intelligence Actually, we allow them to not invest. They were going to buy three new machines. They have 120 big machine tools, and we allow them to avoid investing into those machines. So number one is not only reducing time to value, it's very often the stuff you can do without further investments. Uh, number two, on time to value, when, whenever you implement a, a new, the, the other example is this auto manufacturer. They were going to invest into a new line. And to save money, they had invested into a non-connected line. And surprise, surprise, they had huge problems to bring, because the line was not connected to the right analytics, they had huge problems to reach peak capacity on this line. We convinced them to 
do the additional investment, which was they already had invested 100 million, it was like 500K more to connect the line. And by connecting it to the analytics, we actually allow them to gain control of that line much faster and then get time to value. So number one, potentially avoid investments. And number two, if you, when you do your investments, you have your data under control, usually what you find is you get your new equipment productive and stable much faster. Do you have any example of project with Sojeti High Tech has been involved and what was your approach in that case and where are the activities? So, uh, yes, Sojeti, uh, if we talk about BrainCube in particular, uh, there are, there's been a couple of projects with Sojeti High Tech. Uh, and as we speak, uh, Pascal Jean Conler is investing into a, uh, a specific team. He's, he's hired two people whom we are training on this solution to deploy it faster. Uh, so that's one. There's also many interesting projects around MES, MES implementation, re-implementations. So yes, there is a lot of know-how. And uh, if you want to know more, you reach out to Pascal Jean Conler and or uh, Jacques Mezraïd. Now, I can see the chat, but I cannot see the Q&A. So if anything came through the Q&A, someone needs to tell me. We have one uh, query from Tarek who said, uh, you mentioned on slide 14 that uh, encapsulate and execute without impact, impacting current operations. Are customers receptive of that? If yes, it can open up a lot. Of opportunities. Uh, yes, uh, customers are, are extremely receptive. Um, to give you an example, I, I was at uh, um, Sanofi with a pharma company, and we talked about that. And, and the guy, uh, you know, so agreed, and he said, "I so much agree with you. This is what we need. Show me what you've done it, and and and." I'll, I'll give you the project. He, he, obviously, it was a bit more complex. So we took him to GE to show him the way we've done it. Now, is there, is there a customer need? Absolutely. Is it easy? No. Uh, do we need to invest uh, uh, brain power into uh, de designing the right offers? Absolutely. But again, if you ask uh, somebody like Jacques Mesraïd, or if you ask um, um, Fabrice Le, Patrice Lefranc, who is our MES specialist, they all will tell you it is possible. It just, uh, it just takes um, some sorts. And what we're looking is beyond G oil and gas, find the first clients with whom we're going to do it, and then we're going to develop the architecture styles, and hopefully we'll be much more credible with clients when we sell this idea. Sure. The next one uh, we have from Patrick who says, uh, hello Pascal, very interesting presentation. I have a question. How do you manage uh, interoperability and uh, horizontally and vertically the main principles and how do you talk about it? I, I'm sorry, the question was how do you manage? Interoperability, horizontally and vertically the main yeah. principles yeah. And how do you talk about it? Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, interoperability is a is the issue. It's it's. I, I talked about integration, but that integration is about interoperability, and that's where there is a um, lot of attention today around so-called IoT platforms. So there is a um, you know it's G Predix, it's uh, SAP is trying to come there, it's people like PTC or it's um, more classical enterprise EAI vendors who are uh, coming in with so-called uh, industrial IoT platform that provide this interoperability, that uh, e uh, allow you to integrate to all very different shop floor devices, allow to your other manufacturing applications like the MES, integrate to the ERP, and then develop applications on top of it. And there's a range of solutions. It goes all the way from, if you have a very small factory, you can do this by implementing a solution like PTC SyncWorks, which is a, a partner of us. 
And at the other extreme, we are, as we speak, uh, uh, answering an RFP from Fiat Chrysler for an extremely ambitious interoperability platform, which is a, a specialized enterprise EAI, a uh, microservices-based, extremely ambitious program uh, for which we, uh, we uh, um, provided a, an answer to the RFP earlier this, this week. So there's a big, yes, interoperability is a, big, is a big question. There's a range of solutions, all the way from package solutions to bespoke developments like what Fiat Chrysler is trying to do. And uh, that's, a, that's an area where, again, uh, the portfolio of Capgemini, where we have people in Soviet high tech, for instance, who understand shop floor, we have people who understand MES, we have people who understand ERP, and we have people who understand infrastructure and custom development. That, that's where uh, there's the big opportunity. And by the way, the, 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 the so-called smart mom is a lot about interoperability. So next one we have from Steven, who says, uh, I like that we will the uh, OEM solution. Will that be available for the Capgemini group? So, so also the uh, Soviti employees? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. The, the, so right now, we have selected uh, four main countries, which are US, France, uh, Germany, and the UK. But the Nordics have already expressed interest, so we're going to invite them at the training which is going to take place in the UK. And if other geographies want to get trained and want to invest in the solution, they're most welcome. And obviously, uh, it is, Sojeti, as I said earlier, uh, Sojeti High Tech is already ramping up ex uh, people to become experts on the solution. Okay. Uh, there's one more from uh, Lauren who says, uh, do you have an example of edge analytics, the way to put under control a machine calculator in real time, the target through analytics in a discrete industry? Uh, so in, in real time, no, I don't. Uh, right now, most of our clients, and, and this is, this is not what BrainQ does, by the way. It's not really real time. Uh, and I am not, in my previous life, we did that. Uh, it was edge analytics because we were, uh, we were manufacturing control systems. But uh, I don't know any such example within, within Capgemini or Sojeti today. And, and, the, and, and again, the question was real time edge analytics. I don't know any such case. But I do uh, from my previous life at Schneider. And, and usually it is the domain of uh, people like Rockwell, Schneider Electric. It's more analytics that run on the control system, which is called uh, advanced process control. So, any more questions, uh, participants? We just have a few more minutes left, so kindly expedite. it. All right, if there's, I, if there's no more questions, probably uh, people need to uh, digest. Uh, any, any feedback is most welcome. Uh, I, the feedback we got directly was usually is positive, but if you have uh, not so positive feedback and you don't want to share it online, I'm, I'm absolutely interested to hear it because it's a complex topic and explaining such a complex topic uh, simply is not an easy task. So every remark I get that allows me, allows us to uh, uh, improve the, the, the way we communicate around digital manufacturing is absolutely welcome, number one. Number two, uh, if you have an account where you believe we can go towards digital manufacturing, very interested, that's the most fun part of my job, and usually it works pretty well, so uh, feel free to uh, invite me or my colleagues of the TLI to support you. I guess um, we don't have any more uh, open questions for now. So please fail to reach uh, Kasku in case you're 
you need any more information for uh, any help regarding this. Uh, thanks all for joining us in uh, today's webinar and for your time. And uh, thanks a lot, Pascal, for taking us through this insightful session on the digital manufacturing essentials. Okay, thanks everybody. Looking forward to uh, further collaboration on that topic. Last reminder, this is an inside presentation, but you can use the slides if you uh, if you if you remove uh, slides from 15 or 16 on, which is um, okay. Thanks everybody, Fabri Patrice uh, Patrice Dubo. I've seen you were on, so I'm looking forward to your comments, to your feedback. Bye everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Pascal. Thanks all.